so exciting. Um, I just wanted to ask about um, the, um, the sort of a methodological question about um, the, 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 the likelihood judgment. So I, I, I understand this idea of you um, treat uh, um, how likely you find something as you take a truth maker and view how likely it is, and then you can get, you can kind of capture this uh, thing that you find, like Seth Yasin, and goes back a long time, the psychological observations that you mentioned, uh, where you think like, it's likely Fido will win the race, even though there's lots of other competitors, because Fido is the most likely of the competitors. Um, but I, I just wondered why, I mean, sort of methodologically, why do you want to assume that um, you know, our belief state is a straightforward thing where we kind of assign probabilities to worlds, basically, have a probability space, and then the things we believe have this extra structure to them, like the ways of being true. I mean, what sort of is the preference for doing that rather than making the belief state this more complex thing rather than and having the, um, the propositions, be, uh, the sentences be the, um, the simpler thing? I see. So, so you're saying um, you're saying um, our, our, we could think of our belief state in the way that, say, Bayesians do. It's just sort of like a probability distribution over worlds, and that itself will yield results about how likely you think uh, a certain truth maker is or a certain false maker is. So you don't. I mean, where are these likely? Her judgment is supposed to come from. I sort of point to some heuristic I gather from yeah. a book review that you I read of yours recently that you're not so keen on. <laughs> Over <laughs> emphasis on heuristic. Okay. Um, so so um, I guess part of the reason would so it's 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 tr it's true that if you had a probability distribution over over worlds and you had a particular truth maker. Uh, in mind, then you could use that probability distribution and it would tell you how likely you thought the truth maker was. But I guess part, what's partly playing, well, what is playing a crucial role here is you're sort of rummaging through the, the, the contents of your mind for a truth maker to even test, you know, um, what, what's a likely one to test. You can only judge the, pro assess the probabilities, of, especially if, if you're engaged in sort of inference, as, as would be the case in some of these examples, you need to sort of decide how to use your, cog your, your, your cognitive resources to, like, what am I going to see what's probable and what isn't probable? And, and so there's a certain amount of guesswork involved. You might never even hit on pi as the, as the thing to, to, to th think of. So maybe there's some, some kind of, Usually, if you say metacognition, everybody says, "Oh, that's probably that's probably it." <laughs> so it could be a metacognition. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that was uh, Daniel Rothschild, and Gideon Rosen is coming. You can take your So what's the story in a simple sort of case where I've got some axioms in the language of a propositional calculus? Yeah. And I accept their conjunction. And then I've got some theorem, which is not so easy to deduce, in exactly the same vocabulary. So it doesn't introduce any new sentence letters or anything like that. Is every false maker for the Theorem also a false maker for the conjunction of the axioms? I'm picturing false makers here as assignments of truth values to atoms or something like that. Uh, and if that's how you picture it, then yeah, every false maker for the right. theorem will be a false maker for the conjunction of the axioms. But I can be totally ignorant in this sort of case, too. It doesn't take No, much. right, good. Yeah, so, so th that's, that's really interesting because, I mean, one, one question you're asking is, should we think of the subject matter of, say, a conjunction as just obtained by lumping together the subject matters of the conjuncts? And if you think that the subject matter of the conjunction is just some kind of amalgam of the subject matters of the atoms that, that occur in it, then, that, then that, will be, that will be the case. And so that, um, 
that kind of links up with this larger issue about whether one should think, I mean, suppose you think that subject matter has to do with truth makers. Whether truth makers should be conceived um, on a recursive model, so they just all get sort of passed up by some blindly operating mechanism from the parts to the whole, or whether, so, so here's, an, so, or whether there also can be some emergent truth makers or false makers that take advantage of the, of the relations, say, between disjuncts as it might be. And so this is roughly the difference between should you think of the truth makers as something that would occur in, in a propositional logic case in a minimal, as the, the, the disjuncts of a minimal disjunctive normal form for the sentence as opposed to the complete disjunctive normal form where at, you know, every atom gets assigned to it. So, so if you consider like a, a sentence like, so, you know, say, say, if you're hungry, that makes two of us. So, so if we think about it in propositional logic, logic terms, the truth makers are, you're not hungry, or we're both hungry. But of course, I said it because I know that I'm hungry. I didn't have to know that you weren't hungry. Or that, yeah. And so, so I guess what, I, what I'm thinking is some, some of the time, like so for instance, if you have a bunch of premises and they entail a, a contradiction, then a false maker with a contradiction, especially if it's the absurd, could be something very, very trivial. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that wouldn't be a false maker for any of the, so, so it really just depends on sort of how fast in this you're allowed to play with the notion of an emergent truth maker that you wouldn't guess at. And some of these, like the modus ponens type cases, really, you know, so, so I, I, I believe, you know, maybe I believe um, uh, I have a hand and, you know, if I have a hand then there are material objects uh, but maybe I'm not sure there are, you know, maybe that isn't the best example. Uh, uh, but the thing is, the way I know that that, 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 that that conditional premise doesn't involve looking at the truth makers for the antecedent or the consequent. And so I'll, the only non-trivial truth makers I look at are the ones for I have a hand. <clears throat> and so if I'm going to get a truth maker for their own material objects, well, in that case, <coughs> it's not so hard, but suppose it's like anyone who denies that I have a hand is wrong. Uh, my truth maker for I have a hand is not going to be afford much insight into what would make it true to who are, yeah. Yeah, I really wanted an example involving a, a sort of a logic textbook example <coughs> where it's really clear that the yeah. atoms we're talking about are all independent of one another. Yeah. And it's really clear that the conditional <laughs> is a material conditional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good, good. It's so yeah. easy to generate ignorance. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah that, that's fair enough. Right. No, I think that I think I think you're you're exactly right. That there, there are there are pure um, processing limitations type of uh, mm -hmm. exceptions to uh, omniscience. So sorry. I should, yeah. So I mean, to give a I mean a simple example like this, you know, um, <coughs> you know. It's not easy to realize that P is logically equivalent to P with 10 billion negations in front of it, <laughs> just because of the difficulty of counting the negations. Um, and so that, that there's not a difference in subject matter there. Yeah. Or in truth yeah. yeah. No, so I, I, I totally I agree with that. Uh, and it's a funny kind of example uh, uh, where 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 uh, uh, it seems like it's al it's almost like. It's one of these times that it almost seems as if middle linguistic might, might be going on. Yeah. Right. That's what I was wondering. And as soon as that becomes a resource, yeah, you wonder how many of the other examples have yeah, that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right. Yes. You wonder, and then, and then you think more carefully about what I've said, and then you stop. It's not wonder. <laughs> There's a great example from uh, Alice in Wonderland of, of that form, that, like where the Red Queen asks, she says, "Do you know arithmetic?" And Alice says, "Yeah." She says. What's one plus 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 <laughs> fifty times? Really? She says, I don't know. She says, ah, see, she can't do addition. <laughs> Fantastic. Any question? Then I'll have a, a very sort of naive question. So. I guess one of the 
solutions to logical omniscience would be to go non-classical and say that uh, you know equivalence entanglement is non-classical maybe bring impossible world uh, on board so why don't you like that what did you think of it i don't know uh oh yeah well um so if if so maybe there's two different ideas there so going non-classical might be like having some logic where the conclusions are easier to, to see. And so a version of that that does somewhat fit with what I was saying about parts and whole okay. would be to take the, use a very strong form of relevance entailment where uh, P entails Q, or P entails R only if R is part of Q. And that's, um, and there, there is a theory like that. And, and, uh, 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 Franz Berto and some stuff on yep. logical omniscience yep. uses that, and so I think that that definitely is a, is a thing to try. You're still going to run into the kind of examples that Gideon mentioned. There's going to be sort of combinatorial explosion sort of issues are, are going to arise in any case. Also, um, with regard to impossible worlds, which maybe that idea itself doesn't point you in the direction of a, you know, without without further details, it may or may not point you in the direction of a Non, a particular non-classical non uh, logic, and um, um, and I think a, a question of the kind of Gideon raised could be raised there as well, because I mean, maybe that the worlds that I'm talking about here for this whole story to work would have to include some impossible worlds. Um, like, so an example I didn't talk about what was going to is sort of like logical insight, like realizing that the, the set of statements that can have a proof, which is like an existential property, mm -hmm. is the same as the set of statements that don't have a counter model, which is a universal property, mm -hmm. to realize that an existential property could, so you can think of it sort of graphically, realizing the union of these smaller sets is the same as the intersection of these larger sets. This isn't a counter example, a counter model, that isn't a counter model. But in that kind of case, you've got to be talking about impossible worlds where that would be a kind of model even though it isn't and then you might say oh if you're going to have impossible worlds why why isn't that uh, enough and, that, and that's a very good good, good question and I, don't, I don't waste your time okay. pretending I, I have an answer yet. Daniel? Daniel? I just wanted to be able to take off my mask for a bit. <laughs> um, yeah, I, uh, I was wondering about how this, this is for the purpose of my own talk next. I want to figure out what I'm going to say. So um, another example of a kind of failure of logical omniscience style thing is um, disjunction introduction. So, you know, there's not going to be a coffee break after this. Um, not that I mind that, but um, I can infer that there's not going to be a coffee may break or the stock market will rise 300%. Um, and that seems like a really bad inference. But I'm thinking, and I know you've talked to a lot about that and about this and so on, but I'm wondering how that fits into the way you're speaking today. Because in a way, it's sort of like, okay, I've got a truth maker for the first thing. Yeah. It's a truth maker for, for the disjunct. So yeah. the strategy is looking good. Yeah, um, and so I'm just wondering, like, how do you compare these different failures? What's the this yeah. maybe m m m m m so, so so again on the kind of style of Gideon, like, how do we characterize different failures? Is there a lot of different? Yeah, right. There? Yeah, no, that's good. You know, um, I'll just say after the side, this is something that Wes Holiday has written a lot about, and this is one of his main objections to this way of uh, approaching things, because it might well seem like. Uh, it might well seem sort of, I mean, there's a dynamic in a, in a, in a static version of it. Probably isn't the case that if you believe there's going to be a coffee break, then you already do believe that disjunction. But it might seem that there's no excuse for you if invited to draw the, yeah. And um, so it might be that this is a case, and you also could maybe consider cases where the second disjunct has words you don't even understand. Mm -hmm. Or cases like Crickby talks about where people bring in a strong cleaning scheme, like, you know, uh, there's no coffee or, or the liar paradox, or, some, or, or <laughs> something like, like that. Uh, and um, so this is, this is where the top-down, bottom-up stuff sort of 
comes in. So if you're thinking of uh, a disjunction P or Q from a top down direction, I mean, is, is there going to be a truth maker? You might get, you might crash when you start thinking, well, I don't even know what a truth maker for Q would be, because I don't really understand Q, or else this is something I don't really have any. But then if you play your cards right, you might think, oh, I could bypass that issue. I could just focus on the truth maker that I have uh, for P. Or, I, or you could just say, as you did, um, I have a truth maker for P. I'm just going to ignore Q. I'm going to stick, stick with that one. And it, it could be that you, know, you could still explain some omniscience failures by saying, that, well, the person didn't realize that if they ignored, you know, the second disjunct was just trying to drag them down. You know, if they just ignore it, they can stick with the initial. Uh, uh, so, so it, 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 it could really, just, just as some people say that, uh, you know, whether something is a, a, a defeater undermines your justification depends on sort of how tough-minded you are. You know, whether you're prepared to just sort of ignore it. Um, there might be a, a thing like that here where you're prepared to say, I see what you're trying to do. You're trying to sort of baffle me with this second disjunct. I'm just doing an order. I'm going to stick with P. And, and, and then, then there might be no excuse. Yeah. And is the dynamic aspect that's where when you say P or Q, you're kind of committed to, if you are not P, to infer Q? Is that what you meant by the dynamic aspect? Oh. Or no? Oh, no, not, not, not that necessarily. Um, uh, although that, that's. I believe I've heard that that's not always true. <laughs> um, you know, so, you know. Uh, if you learn, if coffee, if coffee is brought, you don't immediately go out into your E-Trade account and try to, like, <laughs> bet on the market because it's, yeah. Um, um, no, I was thinking more just if inference is involved in this ah, dynamic, okay. dynamic aspect, which, which in these disjunctive cases, they, they don't lend themselves to a static treatment because you didn't, hadn't ever thought, it's, I say, right. no one would assume you already believed it. Yeah. I mean, it's okay. an interesting question, though, because, I mean, in another version, another point in this, I sometimes say, well, you did already believe that either dreamt is an English word MT or there are such words. I don't know whether that's true or not. Or whether, <laughs> yeah, but, but it, no. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. This is a, a, a fellow Aboutness theorist, Laurie Simpson. And Canadian. And Canadian. No, Canadian. Oh, okay. yeah. Oh. I'm Canadian. Now. Canada is a great comedy country. I think it all. <laughs> I used to go to Yuck Yucks a lot when I was in. Yeah. Um, where did you find this, by the way? <laughs> that color uh, you On the interweb. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so, uh, in keeping, um, just a kind of a big picture thing that addresses something you said in the very beginning. Um, informationalizing um, the uh, omniscience cases, the troublemaker cases, essentially, for omniscience. Um, I thought that was really interesting to kind of cast it, cast it uh, with a Frege strategy of making the discrepancy between the entailer and the entail the matter of uh, the information. Um, and, uh, and the other side would be a c case of difference in access yeah. to univocal information yeah. or something like that. Um, and I was wondering, because of the examples you gave earlier, um, whether um, what thoughts you have about um, other sorts of attitudes ah. where you have failures of omniscience, or, or is it all for you a question of simply kinds of belief? Because um, one of the things, about, one of the advantages of the of making it a question of diversity and access, as opposed to diversity and in information, is that it seems to track nicely a kind of a diversity and attitudinal relations we have to those things. Uh -huh. um, and I'm just wondering whether this framework, I mean, it's it's really interesting to try to pack the the diversity into the information side, but whether this can whether this can track this type of diversity. I mean, the regret case, for example, seems, that failure of omniscience seems very different to me mm -hmm. than 
cases of um, belief, uh, failure yeah. of omniscience when it comes to belief, and other cases too. So, yeah, it's it's really like as they yeah. say in the business, invitation to say more uh, about this. No, that's a that's a really a really good good question. Uh, um, it does seem like something. I agree with you that that. Uh, uh, whether you're, you could have two sort of, you might think, truth conditionally equivalent propositions. One background certain information, and then you're happy to say that you regret it. The other like foregrounds the information, and, and then you're not happy to say that uh, uh, you regret it. Now, does that, whether, does that count, what, is whether information is foregrounded or backgrounded, to, can that, does that count as sort of different information as I'm thinking of it? I, I'm thinking it, it, it might. Like, so um, I betrayed my, my friend, say. You, you, you might think, um, I mean, there's different ways of going, but you might think uh, a false maker or, uh, or, 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 or a truth maker for that uh, won't involve my having a friend. <laughs> Whereas the truth maker for I have a friend and I betrayed them yeah. might involve that I'm having a friend. But then you might ask, well then how does the, how do you even get a fact that suffices for the truth of I betrayed my friend that is agnostic about whether right. I, I have a friend? And that's, and that's a really good question. And uh, um, it, it might be that in some of these cases you have to distinguish, um, this is be like a higher grade of informational refinement what makes a sentence true, and what qualifies that to be a truth maker for the, the sentence. So you might think, what, what makes it true that I betrayed my friend is that you know, I betrayed Alice. What makes that a truth maker for I betrayed my friend, I betrayed my friend is that Alice is my friend. Alice is my friend isn't part of why it's true that I betrayed my friend. It is part of why it's true that I have a friend, and I betrayed my friend. So th 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 this is all just to say, I'm prepared to get as <laughs> finicky <laughs> as you like in trying to sort of, uh, if I'm going to try to pursue the different information line, I think you're totally right that you'd need something sort of more tricky, tricky than, than anything I've suggested, but there might still be things. And, and the, presumably the attitudinal diversity then will get packed into these type of, these contrasts in how the information plays out. Well, there's going to be like yeah. this or attitude, yeah. which is univocal. And, um, well, 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 I mean, so you might ask, I mean, I think it's a really good question whether you're, it's really going to be a question whether you're constantly inventing new uh, informational machinery for every attitude type, in which case it seems like a, Flattering it with the title research program and generating research program, <laughs> um, but you might ask. I mean, so I'm inclined to think the following: uh, some someone says, uh, "Oh, uh, here's Ari. Uh, he's my cousin." And then I see you later having coffee, and someone says, uh, "Where where do you go?" And I said, "And I say, uh, your cousin is having coffee." And it seems like I know your cousin is having coffee. Um, but I might not have to take the same epistemic responsibility for your being the cousin. I just, you know, maybe I misheard that. I was just using your cousin to, uh, you're from UCLA, you know about this kind of example, where he, you're, uh, the descriptive information is, com is coming in to identify the individual, whether the information is correct or not is not the main point of the utterance and I'm not taking responsibility for it. So you might think that the same thing that makes it possible for me to know that your cousin is having coffee, even if I can't really say a lot for it's being your cousin, in fact, is the same thing that makes it possible for me to regret that your cousin is having coffee, even if I don't regret that it's your cousin. I mean, you, 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 you might think that, that a single kind of foregrounding background could do that, but that's what it would depend on. I mean, it's, it's, just, it's, it's, it's wishful thinking. Um, yeah. Thanks.
Yes, I'm Matteo Plebani. Thank you for the talk. I was just wondering about how to apply the account you presented to mathematical examples. And it seems to me that we should find truth makers and false makers for mathematical statements. And any ideas? Are they proofs? Something else? Yeah, no, no, that's 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 a great a great question. And you know, I, I, I've um, developed sort of a new respect for this. Um, old idea of, of Wittgenstein's about how you know, the meanings of mathematical sentences are, are given by their ways of being proved as, the, and even more generally for ver verificationism, <laughs> uh, but the, the, the idea that um, you know, ways of establishing something, especially with just canonical ways of doing it, could, could, could play this, uh, this sort of uh, uh, role. But, I guess on the whole, I mean, I think that's one possible way of, of going, but I think um, on the whole, I, I, I'm more inclined to, to just um, think of like the truth maker for a universal claim about numbers as just the, this number has the property, that number has the property. Especially if it's, I mean, I think it might vary from case to case. I mean, suppose there are universal coincidences, where yeah. like every natural number is, Five, but for infinitely many discrete reasons, then the truth makers might be five zero, yeah. five one, five. Two. Um, but there might be other cases where the truth maker is—it's more like a law. Yeah, like a Turing machine that yeah, yields yeah, a yeah. proof for every n. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah but if there's a, yeah, yeah, if there's a uniform yeah. reason, then that might be the uh, the truth maker. But 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 yeah, then that gets you into so I mean that gets you into impossible worlds and. The, the approach that I'm tempted towards is that you, you, you arrive at impossible worlds um, by um, gradually um, lightening up on the essences of the objects you're, t you're, you're, you're talking about. So, so, so you say, you know, suppose you think two exists essentially. Uh, you, might, you might still think, well, that flows from the essence of uh, you, you, you may think there's an even stronger necessity, which is that if two exists, then it's singleton two exists, and you might be able to sort of cancel the essence of two whereby it exists necessarily, but hold on to the essence of sets and say, oh, there, there are now these relatively possible worlds that are, some, you know, they came late to the game, they weren't informed of the essence of two, <laughs> and so they sort of got through the gate. Uh, but, the, but they, they do have to, yeah. Anyway, so. Thank you. Yeah, thank. Good. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.